Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Hello and welcome to Changing Media, conversations with people who are doing just that in our evolving multimedia universe. I'm Lee Thornton and my guest today is Robert Cox, president of the Media Bloggers Association. We're talking about the blogosphere and it's called that for a reason. Here are some rather startling facts from IntelliSeq, a provider of business intelligence. About 20,000 new blogs are created daily and an estimated 10 million U.S. blogs will exist by the end of this year. According to the Pew Internet and American Life Project, 32 million Americans read blogs. Bloggers are laying claim to territory that once belonged exclusively to traditional journalists, and the implications for the future are enormous. Thanks for being here, Bob. Thanks for having me. You are the founder and president of the Media Bloggers Association. Why'd you start it? I started it after my own experience of uh, having a large news organization come after me for something I wrote in my blog and in talking to other bloggers saw a need for us to associate to pay, uh, defend ourselves. Okay, but we'll get into that. By way of background, grad study at the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. School of Business. Uh, you've been a Wall Street trader. Mm -hmm. You've worked as a consultant at the management consulting firm Booz Allen, right. Hamilton. Worked all over the world. Um, your blog is two years old, and in celebrating that fact, you've noted that you turned Maureen Dowd's name into a verb, which is? Doubtification. <laughs> meaning? Uh, to alter the meaning of a uh, quote by using an ellipsis to truncate the quote, turn it into something else. You're mean. <laughs> Made the New York Times really mad by doing what? I wrote a satire of their uh, New York Times op-ed columnist correction policy. They weren't too keen on that. And you got the Times to make some important concessions about their corrections policy. You got to appear on a lot of TV and radio shows. You made a major story in the, had a major story in the New York Daily News, which was? Well, it was about the resolution of that matter with the, uh, with the New York Times. With the New York yeah. Times. Mm -hmm. uh, via an AP Wire story, you got into hundreds of other papers. You organized the Bloggers Association. You organized Blog Nashville, which is? That was, the, at the time, the largest, and I still believe the largest uh, or, uh, gathering of bloggers in the United States. We had over 300 bloggers in Nashville. And you concluded that after two years, that blogging is, quote, pretty damn cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's safe to say you're a blogging success story. There is no question that bloggers are having their impact, and the so-called old media are the ones being affected, particularly journalists, and some say there's a war going on. Do you see it that way? Well, there's a war for those who want it. Um, I think that bloggers are, uh, you know, uh, working with journalists in many cases. Uh, there are some uh, journalists, there are also editors of large news organizations who view blogging as a threat. They view bloggers themselves as irresponsible. Uh, <clears throat> many of those types of critics would treat all bloggers as being something akin to Matt Drudge. Um, but they're wrong. Well, I think that there are good bloggers and bad bloggers, but there are also good journalists, bad journalists, good newspapers, and bad newspapers. And so I think you have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis. If there is to be um, a, a, uh, a complementary relationship between the two, how, how would it work? How does it best work? Well, I think that what, what it started out as and, and what got the attention of, of the media in general was bloggers fact-checking articles by journalists and uh, raising awareness when errors were made in stories. And uh, for most of the journalists that I run across, um, you know, they're busy going on to the next story, so they're not really looking back and worrying about some details of their story. And so bloggers have shown an ability to identify a problem with the story and then continue talking about it to their readership and build it out on the blogosphere. So I think that that's where it began. 
But I think bloggers are now starting to break stories. They're starting to do original reporting. Um, they're very good at carrying on stories that uh, drop off the radar at a major publication or news outlet. Um, so I, I think that at the end of the day, they can work together. I also think and, and know for a fact from talking to many journalists that many of them are reading blogs as looking for ideas for stories and what's going on out there in the country. And of course, many journalists now have blogs. Yeah, so. that helps. <laughs> uh, um, do you see a risk in going after major news organizations, especially on issues of accuracy? Well, uh, we'll talk about it, but uh, there is a risk, which is that uh, they have resources to go after individual bloggers, and they can make life uh, quite miserable for them. Um, I think that that has changed. Uh, two or three years ago, I think that the mainstream media or traditional media didn't know what to make of blogging. Um, I think now it's begun to accept it as a valid form of media and is looking for ways to work with bloggers and in fact as you mentioned uh, incorporating blogging into what they do so you know Brian Williams at NBC News has a blog the New York Times just acquired a company about dot com that is all about blogging so I think what you're seeing is uh, a merging of the two but you have to know I think I know that those journalists and I won't point out Brian you just used his name they don't think of themselves in the same terms um, as bloggers well, I think that... They're, they're journalists writing on the Internet. But they they think... would use it as an extension of what they're doing, yeah. But I, I think that you know, they're, they're, blogging is a terrible term, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not descriptive of anything. It's mostly an empty vessel into which different people pour different meanings. And so it, it makes it difficult to have a, a conversation because um, it, it ends up meaning many different things. Citizens' media is something that means something, which is that those are... Uh, non-professionals who as a sideline are doing reporting, a lot of opinion writing, video, audio, that kind of stuff. I think certainly Brian Williams or, or people at NBC News don't consider themselves citizens media, but I think that's what is important about blogging is it's bringing into the, the national dialogue uh, a whole new set of people that otherwise would have no voice. Tell me um Tell me about that battle with the New York Times. How did that whole thing evolve? Well, that actually was what launched my current blog, thenationaldebate.com, uh, back in May of 2003. I had been fiddling around with blogs for about a year and really didn't know what I wanted to say. And um, in the course of trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the blog, I uh, read an article uh, column by Maureen Dowd in the New York Times in May of 2003 which uh, <clears throat> took a quote from President Bush and altered it to make him say something he didn't say. Uh, she went on then to use that quote to blame him for the deaths of eight Americans in Riyadh in her column. And I thought it was really beyond the pale. I had actually seen the speech that he had given, so I knew what she had written was wrong. And uh, I went through the normal process of attempting to uh, alert the Times that there was a problem. To set the context, this was three days after the Jason Blair story uh, had broken that previous weekend and uh, the Times was out publicly saying we want to hear from readers if we have a problem in the story. My experience was very different from what they were saying. I was treated as pretty much a pariah. When I finally got through to somebody at the Times they wanted to know what my agenda was and I said well as a reader I'd like you to get it right and um, they didn't want to listen to me. So I started blogging and uh, within a couple of weeks, a firestorm had erupted over this quote, and that's where the term datification uh, was recognized. People saw what I had written, which is that I had the speech, I had the audio from the speech, and then I had her version of the quote, which was entirely fabricated from uh, something he had said using an ellipsis to, to sort of mix and match. And uh, that was really the beginning uh, of, uh, of, of getting started. And, um, I pounded away on, on that issue as a blogger, a blogger does, um, for about six months and uh, found out that what Dowd had done actually wasn't against New York Times policy. The Times policy was is that the op-ed columnists were free to decide what got corrected and didn't in their story, in their columns. And uh, so I began going after the policy. And another six months later, uh, my efforts to change it into a policy issue began to bear fruit and where it really struck home was I wrote up a satire page which was a version of uh, quotes, uh, co uh, corrections uh, from New York Times columns based on my views as well as, <coughs> excuse me, as well as uh, views of other uh, bloggers out there. 
and I uh, used the Times uh, web page as a format. So it looked a lot like uh, a Times web page, and uh, they were not amused. <laughs> Um, how did they um, express their lack of amusement? Well, I got a FedEx in the mail about two weeks after the uh, satire appeared, uh, instructing me that they were going to sue me if I didn't take uh, my entire website down. And they also sent uh, a, uh, a legal letter over to my internet provider, uh, threatening them as well if they didn't shut down my site. And in the end, you won. Well, in the end, uh, they 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 underestimated the power of the blogosphere, which is that uh, rather than run and hide, I took every single document, every single threat they made against me, scanned it, put it up on my website, and sent it out to every blogger I knew. Bloggers around the world began to link to the story, and it became a story in and of itself what the New York Times was, was doing. Do you think their reaction um, might have been different had this not been during the Jason, around the time of the Jason Blair episode, as you said? Well. Actually, I think that um, the, the, the reaction to the Times was mixed. There was people like Dan Ockrent and Alan Siegel at the Times who were very sympathetic to what I was trying to say. And there were others like Gail Collins and Maureen Dowd herself who weren't interested at all what I had to say. And I think that there was a, a little turmoil at the Times over this, and that was really the shakeout from that. So I think that on the one hand, the overreaction of coming after me on, uh, through the legal department was a part of that. But I think also ultimately the resolution of that matter, which was a positive one, which is they actually changed the policy. Um, they actually published the new policy on the website, and they have then since followed through uh, on noting corrections uh, clearly in their column and all that kind of stuff uh, was the result of their effort to, to do better. And to be truthful, it helped your career. Well, the whole I was, episode. Yeah, I mean, that was really where I made my bones as a blogger. I mean, I was one of uh, hundreds made of thousands. Made your bones? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, I That's would say, good. yeah, I would say that, uh, you know, uh, there was probably a couple hundred thousand bloggers at the time. And, it, uh, you know, as a blogger, I don't have any marketing budget or I don't have any <laughs> kind of media profile. So this is a way people got to know me and start to read me, you know. I'm going to write an article about making your bones as a blogger. <laughs> well, that's one way. Get sued. What are the most important legal and, and regulatory issues facing bloggers, do you think? Uh, well, I think uh, these issues related to the shield laws are important. I think some of the employment issues are important. Um, and uh, you know, really, these are probably the, the, the two main ones that, that preoccupy bloggers. Am I going to get fired for what I'm writing on my blog? Um, and if I get some information uh, and I publish it, will I be afforded the same protections as, say, a newspaper, a, a writer working for a newspaper? And so far, the answer hasn't been clear on that. Right. And how, how can it ever become clear? How are these things going to have to be resolved? Well, by precedents, by legal precedents, or what? Yeah. I mean, there was a case out in San Francisco involving Apple Computer and a couple of bloggers out there. And uh, my organization, the Media Bloggers Association, filed a MECAS brief on that. And um, uh, it, it was attempting to protect these bloggers who had revealed some what were deemed by Apple trade secrets um, to, their, to their readership, the kind of thing that a trade publication routinely does in the computer industry. Uh, but Apple sued them. And uh, at the end of the day, the court uh, ruled in favor of Apple but didn't speak to this particular issue. There are, I know because I'm talking to them as the president of the Media Bloggers Association, other organizations out there like the Society for Professional Journalists and others that are trying to figure out a way to shape language that could cover bloggers in what they're doing with things like an effort for a federal shield law. Mm. Bloggers are using video from news outlets, is that mm -hmm. correct? What, uh, what do you expect, do you expect that practice to be attacked? Um, that seems to me not okay. To yeah. just pull down somebody's video and put it in your blog. Well, I, I agree. I mean, on a, uh, not as the president of the Media Bloggers Association, but on my personal blog, I've written about that. Um, no, I think uh, there, there is something wrong with it. Uh, clearly, you're taking copyrighted material and you're, you're, you're presenting it in a way that's not authorized. Um, the news organizations, mostly the cable news channels, have by and large uh, let that go. But that changed recently. C-SPAN has started to come after bloggers who've been putting up their material. I think where it gets into an issue is there are some blogs out there, and some of them are members of our organization, uh, who are actually trying to build business models around selling ads based on taking down other people's video footage. That I really can't defend. Mm. Uh, good. I'm glad you're not, <laughs> not defending that. 
you said, um, talking back, harkening back to the, the issue of accuracy, um, no one has died from an inaccurate report in a blog. That was about Newsweek, I think. And what else? Well, it was really in response to the criticism of bloggers and, and, and uh, uh, something that I've experienced in doing a fair amount of media as the president of this organization, which is that, uh, and, and you're an exception in this case, but uh, much of the questioning that I get starts from the assumption that bloggers are irresponsible people who really don't care about getting it right. And uh, I, I'd say probably at the point I wrote that piece, I had had probably 25 interviews in a row where that was one of the first three questions I got. And uh, I think that that is uh, tremendously unfair because it really doesn't make any distinction between a blogger who takes what they're doing seriously, and I'd like to think I'm one, and, and somebody who really is just a, a hack, mm -hmm. um, who's just trying to get attention for what they write and be controversial. Um, you know, bloggers may make mistakes, uh, they certainly do, but what I like about when a blogger makes a mistake is, is that good ones, most of them, are very quick to make a correction, not only to make a correction, but to clearly indicate it using strikeouts and so forth, often linked to the person who notified them of the correction and give them credit for it. And uh, I don't see a lot of that in the major media. I mean, I read a lot of newspapers, watch a lot of cable news, listen to a lot of radio, and I hear of things all the time coming across the air in print that are just flat out wrong. I know the topic and I know what they're saying is wrong, uh, but there really is no avenue to correct the record. One of the advantages bloggers have is they have hyperlinking, so that they, if they make a mistake, they can link to somebody who pointed out the error, and they can actually link to the correct information so the reader can go follow it. Yes, there have been studies. I think NewsLab in particular has done studies showing an enormous number, everything from misspell words on the screen to whatever, factual errors of all kinds. We know there is a lot, there are a lot of inaccuracies in both print and broadcast, and, and particularly, unfortunately, broadcast. What could, they can't hyperlink. What could they do, uh, traditional journalists, on a day-to-day -day basis that would please you in terms of the accuracy of, of the news media? Well, I probably would separate TV and radio from print. Mm -hmm. Print clearly has the opportunity through their own websites to be more proactive in engaging their readership um, and also engaging the blogosphere for that matter. And uh, uh, a simple example is that they, when they run a story, uh, there ought to be the ability for people to comment on the story or to link back to that story and otherwise have some kind of a dialogue with the writer who wrote that story. But, but aren't there websites doing a lot of that? News, uh, there there are. That's begun to change over the, about the past year. And in fact, the, there are some uh, newspapers out there who've moved to fully embracing blogging mm -hmm. as their web presence, which is a, a, a very good thing. Not because I'm pro-blogging, I am, but because I think what it does is it gives both the writer and the reader more flexibility to have a dialogue after the story is published. There are um, a lot of journalists who whose error rate is very low, mm -hmm. um, who don't, or who may or may not look at bloggers at, as irresponsible people without the right to encroach on, on what journalists are trained to do. This is another buzzword, the training of these, you know, citizen journalists or, or bloggers or whatever. Um, at any point, do they have righteous reservations <laughs> to you? Well, the best way I can answer that is what we're doing as an organization. The Media Bloggers Association will soon announce a partnership with the Pointer Institute's News University, which is a Knight Foundation-backed effort to create online learning for journalists. And what we have done is agree to develop curriculum for them that's blogger-specific. And so we're going to encourage our members and anybody else who's blogging who wants to, to, to um, participate um, to be able to take courses in things like story structure and interviewing and fact gathering and fact checking and that kind of basic journalism, uh, but also to get into issues about copyright and trademark, defamation, legal issues that are important to bloggers, as well as technical issues like about podcasting and RSS feeds. So the best thing I can say is, is that what we're going to do is try to make as much learning available through this partnership to bloggers. Some bloggers will take advantage of that and some won't. After we've offered it for a while, then I'd be willing to criticize bloggers who don't have that training because they've had the chance. Right now, they haven't really had the chance. Ah, oh, I hadn't, uh, well, no way to know about that. Uh, so we're making news here on Yeah, that has not been announced show. yet. Well. Probably be announced in September, yeah. Super. Um, you wrote not so long ago, um, 
piece headlined, The Empire Strikes Back. Mm -hmm. um, what was that about? And, and it involved web reputation and web reputation task forces. Yeah, the, the, the context for that was sort of a dialogue that goes on among bloggers. Um, I have attended quite a few conferences at Stanford and Harvard and uh, in between. Uh, ran a conference down in Nashville that you mentioned. And uh, bloggers uh, have a little bit of a sort of, you know, rose-colored glasses looking at what they're doing and thinking that, uh, you know, it's wonderful that they get their soapbox and they get to say what they want to say and nobody can edit them or interfere with them. But I think most of them are not aware of the fact that there are forces moving out there that don't like that. And they are taking action. So you've had cases now where cities like San Francisco looked at restricting, restricting blog speech related to campaigns. The FEC is looking at that issue right now about regulating campaign speech on blogs. Corporations have litigated. In my case, the New York Times came after me. But also corporations are, are firing or suing employees who disclose information or otherwise do things that reflects badly on their company. So there are a whole bunch of forces out there that aren't comfortable with the unfettered freedom of blogging. And they're not doing nothing. And so bloggers need to be aware of that. And that's part of the reason that the Media Bloggers Association exists, because bloggers are going to need, if they don't realize it now, somebody to represent their interests and push back on that. But you don't, you don't really believe there's any, there's any stopping the, the, the movement, do you? Well, I think that uh, the FEC can certainly make trouble for blockers if they're going to do things like take away their rights to take ads, which are the way that many of them are funded from political candidates. Um, people are going to be very upset about that. I mean, there, there's a number of things that can be done. I mean, certainly the threat of being fired because you have a blog is very real. I just received an email this morning from a member out in Chicago who informed me he was shutting down his blog. Even though it has nothing to do with what his company does, his company told him, we don't want you having a public profile that way, and so he's shutting it down. Now, mm -hmm. that kind of thing is troubling to me as the president of the organization and as a blogger and as an American. I think that it's wrong that people should be uh, you know, threatened or feel uncomfortable with speaking their mind. I, I understand if somebody is doing something that reflects badly on their company. I work for General Motors, and I'm praising Ford cars and bashing GM cars. OK, that's one thing. But if I'm talking about the Supreme Court or some other political issue, and I happen to work for General Motors, I should have the right to do that. Mm. I want to talk briefly about a couple of, of blogging incidents of recent, uh, recent months, um, one of which I think reflected well on bloggers. And the other, and you can correct me on this, the other I didn't. And I, that, the two incidents being the Rather episode mm -hmm. And the Eason Jordan episode. Which one didn't you like? <laughs> I kind of thought it was was too bad. Eason Jordan felt he had to quit his job. Yeah. I, well, I did. I, 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 I'll, I'll talk about that first. I mean, I um, I remember it was on a Friday, and uh, Friday evening that he resigned. His resignation was announced, and uh, I was shocked because I didn't really feel that what had been going on really warranted him resigning. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't quite get that. I mean, there had been some other issues with him and some things he had said in the past and so forth. Um, so I'm, I'm surprised. I don't know if it was a good thing or bad thing. I, I think it's odd that somebody would resign a professional, high up professional opinion in the world of journalism over criticism that they were receiving in the blogosphere. Um, it seems a little odd to me. Should the, should the blogger have, we talked about this before on this program, but should the blogger have printed his remarks when he had said they were off the record? Well, the strange thing about it is is that the fella who blogged that was the official blogger for the event, and he blogged it on the World Economic Forum's website. He was told to do that. And so he was floating around at these various meetings and jotting down notes and writing things, and he wrote about this was a hot topic and this is what went on. That's what began it. That's what piqued people's curiosity. So. To that extent, um, I don't know how they worked that out at the World Economic Forum, but they were actually sending bloggers in on their dime to publish on their website. Oh. So I don't know that that's so really a, de a defense. If it was an error, it was their own error. Well, I mean, they have this rule, and it's some British rule that uh, mm -hmm. things are supposed to be kept off the record. But the reality is, is that everybody who's sitting in this room knows uh, that there's video 
cameras running and the rooms are full of right. journalists and right. you know things uh, news gets made all the time mm -hmm. so I don't know if that's really a defense I think the problem that he had is is that he probably got worked up on an issue went too far and um, you know, mm -hmm. the problem is in this age mm -hmm. of blogging, everything you say is yeah. now being captured mm -hmm. no matter where you are, and he was held to that. Tell me briefly, what was the take-home message from the Dan Rather episode? Uh, well, I think it's with, with any of these things, with, with, with media or other public uh, uh, people dealing with bloggers, and when there's some kind of a blog storm going, which is be honest, be straight up. I mean, the most absurd moment of that entire incident was Dan Rather making a statement after two weeks of, if it turns out that this is wrong, we want to be the ones to break the story. Now, that's almost laughable, <laughs> considering that they're about the last people to know that uh, these documents were questionable. So uh, he wouldn't have uh, had a problem. He wouldn't have lost his job if he had simply gone on the first night and said, we may have made a mistake and we want to look at it and I think people would have respected that. It certainly would have taken the wind out of the sail of all the bloggers. I mean, bloggers feed off of that kind of a denial. Um, we have less than a minute. I want to do something very, very quickly. You made some predictions about what would happen in 2005. Uh, a couple of them haven't yet come true, um, but the year still has a way to go. But you did say that a major newspaper publisher would experiment by converting the online version of one of its papers entirely to a meta blog. Has that one happened? Well, uh, Paper North Carolina, the Greensboro News and Record, has done that. The New York Times acquired about.com and they're looking at ways to incorporate blogging very heavily into their website presence. And there are several other newspapers around the country that have done that. The LA Times, uh, uh, much to their dismay, experimented with another thing in the blogging space called a wiki, uh, which turned out to be a bit of a disaster. So um, some newspapers have done this conversion, none of the big ones yet, but I think that's coming. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very, Thank very much you. for being with us. That is all for this time. I will see you next time on Changing Media. For Robert Cox of the Media Bloggers Association, I'm Lee Thornton.